But as we come and seek his blessing upon us, let's come to God in prayer together now. Let us all pray. Lord, we give you praise and thanks this afternoon that we can come to you through our Lord Jesus Christ. We bless and glorify your great name. We thank you that you're the God of salvation, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father who purposed to save to his glory a people for himself out of all the nations of the world. Jesus Christ, our great prophet, priest, and king, the head of the church, we come to you in his name and rely entirely upon his merits. And pray now for the Holy Spirit's presence and, and help that as we meet together and worship together, we may know that you are the living God work in our hearts and lives. So hear us now, Lord, as we come to you, in that mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, we worship God and sing an opening hymn together. All the hymns are on the leaflet and displayed for us. Our first hymn, Great is the Gospel of our Glorious God. Scripture reading is from Matthew 18, verses 1 through 22. <clears throat> Let us hear God's word. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them, and he said,
Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become the little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung round their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you, that the angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. <laughs> if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. <coughs> Again, truly I tell you, that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Amen. Thanks be to God for his holy word. Let's come to God in prayer now. Let's pray to him. We thank and praise you, our Heavenly Father, for the tender love of yours towards believing sinners that we have just read of. We acknowledge you as the great God above all, the creator of everything, the only one who is absolute or eternal, we acknowledge our smallness and our dependence on you, that this universe only exists because you chose to create. We humble ourselves before you indeed. And at the same time, we praise and thank you for your tender mercy and love. We are nearly your dependent creatures. We are sinners and rebels against you. And yet, you loved us and gave your son to be our saviour. We thank you that in him we have redemption through the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of your grace that you lavish on us. And so we rest upon the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we rest upon the promise of the gospel that he who believes has eternal life. Thank you, oh Heavenly Father that as part of that life now, we may come with confidence and boldness into your presence. We may cast our cares upon you. We may pour out our hearts before you 
and we may pray for the work of your kingdom on earth. And we come this afternoon to do that. We thank you for the work of this seminary, the main course and the Pastors Academy, the Flourish course and the other things that are done from this place. We thank you for assisting in this past year. We thank you for those who have come and taught your truth. We thank you for the gifts and the presence of your Holy Spirit that you have granted time and time again. And we thank you for the students who have given attention, who have done work. We thank you, O oh God, for the enlightening work of your spirit. For we know that the Bible is not enough. Yes, it's enough as our standard of faith. But we need the revealing and enlightening work of your Holy Spirit in every single servant of yours. And we thank you that many pennies have dropped in the past 12 months through the activity of your gracious spirit. Thank you, O oh Father. We commit the graduating students to you as well. We'll pray for them more later, but, oh God, we thank you for these men. We thank you for the help you have given them. We thank you for the way that you are leading them into your work. And we thank you for our fellowship with them and the love and the encouragement we have received from them in these past years. And, oh gracious God, we pray for your help in the future of the college supply all the lecturers and teachers that are needed, supply people who are filled with the Holy Spirit and with faith, as well as orthodox in that faith, and suitably gifted. We pray you will strengthen the principal and the vice principal and those others in leadership positions. We pray you will give enlightenment to the board and strengthen them in what they think about, as well as in the decisions and the speed of the decisions that they come to. We pray that through the work of this college, your kingdom will come more fully and your will of people submitting to you in glad and in joy and showing the reality of Christ in their lives. We pray that your kingdom will come more fully on earth through the work done in this place and from this place and that your will will be done more fully for your glory. Oh God, help us. We pray as we train men and women here, and those who are doing initial study and those who are doing further study, be with us and lead us forward for the glory of Jesus Christ, we ask. Amen. Amen. We're we'll going to sing another hymn together now, and following the singing of the next hymn, Bill James, the principal of the seminary, will come and give us a report and also introduce to us and we'll hear testimonies from the students who have completed their studies and are leaving at this time. So let's join together as we sing the next hymn on the leaflet. Rejoice, the Saviour reigns among the sons of men. And as the music starts to play, we'll stand to sing.
please be seated. As I come to give the uh, principal's report uh, this year, it is with a real sense of thanksgiving and praise to God for his goodness uh, over the past year. It's an enormous privilege to be engaged in the work of training pastors and preachers who will go out to lead local churches and preach the gospel uh, we trust in the goodness of God for years to come. There is no greater message than the gospel, the declaration of God's love for sinners. There is no one more glorious than our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has died and is risen and exalted for our salvation. And there is no project more urgent than the gathering of people from every tribe and tongue and nation into God's kingdom. As we look at our nation today, in political and spiritual confusion, we pray that the Lord would have mercy upon us. We want to see thriving, godly, local churches where the gospel is preached and Christ is honoured. We desire that many would be saved and added to Christ's church. And one of the main means by which the Lord accomplishes these ends is the raising up of preachers and pastors and evangelists to lead the church and to proclaim the gospel. And so it is the work of the seminary to serve the churches by training and equipping those whom the Lord has called to this ministry. There are many challenges in our day as in every day. Uh, we are not surprised at that. We are engaged in a struggle, not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers. And we know that the men who have now completed their studies and are going into ministry will face challenges both from within the church and also from the world. But our confidence is not in our own gifts or resources, but in the Lord's promise that he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And today we give thanks that the Lord is calling laborers into his harvest field. We're grateful for the students whom the Lord has brought to study at the seminary. In September, we welcomed 11 new students. We're grateful that these men have settled quickly into seminary life and lecturers have commented on their enthusiasm for study and history. But it is not just that our student body has an appetite to learn. There is a real sense of fellowship together. We are a band of brothers working together with a common mind and purpose to prepare for the ministries which lie ahead. We begin each day with morning worship with a student not only preaching, but leading us in open prayer. Student prayer meetings have continued each week, and students have also met up regularly in pairs or triplets for regular prayer and accountability. Our desire is to train students not only in theology, but also in godliness. And we are very conscious that without the blessing of the Holy Spirit, nothing of lasting value will be accomplished. We are enormously grateful to our lecturers for their labours. I know from my own experience that it is a major commitment to teach at seminary alongside pastoral ministry. And I need to recall thanks in particular to Stephen Clark, who has taught much of the systematic theology course, uh, to Robert Strivens, who has taught much of the church history, and Chris Bennett, who has taught parts of a variety of courses including Hebrew and preaching and Old Testament and New Testament. In September, we will begin teaching a new revised curriculum. There will be new courses in hermeneutics and biblical theology. And each year we have made space for two weeks of special lectures from a visiting lecturer. Last October, we greatly appreciated a week of special lectures by Joel Beakey on experiential preaching. Now, such weeks will become a regular feature of the seminary year. 
In October, we look forward to the visit of Dr. Craig Carter, who will teach for a week on the theme of pre-modern exegesis, especially from the book of Isaiah, both for seminary students and also for visiting pastors under the auspices of the Pastors' Academy, giving us insights into the methodology of uh, uh, those who labored and preached and wrote commentaries in the pre-critical times. In June, our special lecturer will be Michael Haken, teaching for a week on the history and the spirituality of the early English Baptists. And the changes in the curriculum mean that some of our lecturers will no longer be teaching on the course. I want to give thanks for all of them, and in particular to Mostyn Roberts, who has taught systematic theology over many years, for Phil Arthur, who has taught the Reformation, for Keith Ferdinando, who has made a major contribution to our teaching on mission, and for Nigel Graham and Rupert Bentley Taylor on the preaching course. Chris Bennett will be reducing his teaching load next year, and we will now focus on teaching Hebrew and preaching. The Flourish course for pastors' wives and women workers continues to grow and develop. Next year, we anticipate that it will continue in both London and Leeds. And in 2020, we look forward to the development of a new course in the Midlands. It's been moving to hear the feedback of some of the women on the course this year, how uh, indeed the teaching has opened new horizons of understanding for them in the Bible and theology and equip them uh, better to uh, support their husbands in ministry of their pastor's wives, but also more generally, how to encourage women's ministry in their churches. We're very grateful to Julia Jones, who has done a wonderful job of leading this course, and to Alan, who has been responsible for Flourish North. The plant course has also continued in London and Manchester this year, training and encouraging church planters. And we're grateful to Neil Powell in London and Ralph Cunnington in Manchester for their leadership. We should also give thanks for the seminary staff, including David Green, our vice principal, who is currently on study leave, uh, Nigel Redford, our registrar, and Hilary Roberts, who is a part-time administrator. Uh, Ruth Godden started work as our part-time bookkeeper this year, and her efficiency and clarity of thinking have already proved to be a great asset. Hilary Batty, our administrator, is leaving us at the end of this month. And we must record our thanks for her hard work, and in particular, her diligence and her attention to detail over the past three years. We wish her well for the future. Meanwhile, we're glad to welcome Haddon Turner as our new administrator, who started work less than two weeks ago, and I hope you'll take the opportunity to meet him this afternoon over tea on the lawn. We're very grateful to the Kensit Memorial Trust, with whom we work in partnership as our landlords, and for their staff, Gennady and Lydia and Giovanni. And we're grateful to Giovanni for his organization of the tea this afternoon. Much of the work for this afternoon's service and tea, including the flames, has been done by members of Kensit Evangelical Church. And we're grateful for them, not only today, but for their prayerful support and their fellowship throughout the year. The work of the Pastors' Academy continues to develop under the leadership of Gary Williams. And while our partnership with Westminster Seminary has now uh, come to an end, we're excited about the possibilities of our new partnership with Puritan and Reformed Theological Seminary in the States. This enables us to offer part-time master's degrees, not only now in historical theology, but also in biblical studies and systematics. And we trust this will prove to be increasingly popular with pastors who wish to study with us part-time. We also offer a part-time doctoral program. This summer, we look forward to welcoming Neil Martin as a new part-time tutor in biblical studies with the Pastors Academy. Uh, Neil is just completing his DPhil at Oxford on the book of Galatians, and his expertise on biblical studies will be invaluable, not only in the master's program, but also in biblical study days and study breaks for pastors alongside Gary's doctrine study days. John Benton and Malcolm McGregor have been busy this year serving pastors who need pastoral support. John is currently in touch with about 50 pastors 
And it is clear that this ministry is making a significant difference in the lives and the ministries of these men. We are very grateful for the generosity which has made this work possible. So there is much for which we can give thanks. And as we look to the future, we trust that the Lord will help and enable us to face the challenges which lie ahead. Our great desire is that the Lord's name be glorified. So our vision is for the reformation of the church in the United Kingdom and beyond through the training and the spiritual encouragement of pastors and preachers. We're encouraged that the Lord is calling men into ministry and bringing them here to train. We're encouraged at the prospect of a good intake of new students again in this September. And we trust that the Lord will see the need of a rigorous and well-rounded preparation for ministry. As we maintain this vision, there are some specific challenges for your prayers. <coughs> First, it is a great privilege and opportunity to be serving the Lord here in London, in the midst of such extraordinary ethnic diversity and variety of ethnic churches. The Lord has given us the opportunity to train men from a variety of different backgrounds. And I trust that this opportunity might grow and increase. It would be wonderful to see more men being trained so that ethnic churches are served with powerful biblical ministry. Secondly, as we plan for growth in the work of the seminary here, we're conscious of the pressure on the existing buildings and the need for further development, in the area of married and family accommodation. Please pray that the Lord would enable us to make progress in this area. In preparation for future development, the seminary board is currently making the conversion from registered charity to charitable incorporated organization with all of the advantages that incorporation brings. The new CIO has been registered with the charity commissioners and you will hear more of it in due course. And then thirdly, we continue to explore the possibility of a northern seminary and pray that the north of England would be better served by residential training for pastors and preachers and others. So in all of these things, we covet your prayers and your practical support with thanksgiving for what the Lord has already done amongst us. More than anything else, we covet the Lord's blessing without which we can do nothing of enduring value. May the Lord continue to use us to serve the church as well, and ultimately for the extension of his kingdom and his glory in the church, both in this country and beyond. Now, today is a day which in some sense is bittersweet. It's a day of rejoicing, as I said, and a day of thanksgiving and praise to God. It is also a day of farewell to some of our beloved students, five of them who are leaving us uh, today to go out into ministry or to be able to devote themselves more completely to the ministries in which they are already engaged. We rejoice at the ministries that lie ahead. We look forward to the possibilities. And yet, brethren, we will miss you. I'm going to ask them one by one to come up in the, uh, uh, and uh, give a testimony. Uh, which will be uh, a uh, marvel of uh, condensed communication. Uh, each student has only two minutes to reflect on his time at seminary, uh, to give thanks, to tell us about the ministry opportunities and challenges lie ahead, and to tell us how we can be praying for them. If you open up your order of service, you will find there is an insert giving details of the leading students and we're going to follow along in the same order as the students appear in that insert. So first is our brother Wale. Wale, do come up. And while Wale is coming up, I'm going to explain also that this year we received a generous legacy from a lady called Anna Maria Van Deventer, who was at Westminster Chapel in the 1950s and 60s and very much enjoyed the ministry of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. And one of her wishes in her legacy was that students be given some well-chosen and so uh, this afternoon I'm going to be giving our departing students a package of Lloyd-Jones uh, books to send them and speed them on their way 
into ministry. Brother Wiley, do you want to come and share with us? I've been with um, Reverend James a long time to know that two minutes is two minutes. I don't want to be called into his office on Monday to participate. <laughs> so I've written my stuff down. Two minutes and I'm, I'm out of here. Six months into my study at the seminary on the 9th of March 2016, I was called to leave the church plant of Church Hill Baptist Church, which is now known as Grace Church Walthamstow. So I have been there now for three years next week. <coughs> and hope to continue there, God willing, until God calls me to go elsewhere. I don't know. It has been a purposefully grinding church replant alongside my studies here. But now that the course has ended, it will afford me the luxury of two additional days. I've been looking forward to my Thursdays and Fridays <laughs> to fully plunge into the work in Walthamstow. How can you pray for me? What a privilege to have so many of you wanting to pray for me. What a privilege. Thank you. Two prayer items for me. Two prayer items. Pray that I may know Christ more, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his stuff. Pray for physical strength for me. My health is not good. I want to be able to turn the Federal Republic of Islam, which is what Walthamstow is known as, into the very square inch of Jesus Christ, on which he cries, this land is mine. Thank you, brothers. Thank you, Lord. Thank you very much, Dave. This is my real name. <laughs> well, we discovered. <laughs> two minutes. Um, now I finished. Um, I will be uh, a pastor in Iden Green Congregational Church. <coughs> Um, I, I would like to say thank you to everyone who support me. I would like to say thank you to, to Mr. Mark Dennis. He generously support me my second year full time. And for great privilege I had to become a member of this church and and honor to, to be students here on the seminary. I would like to, to ask, you, uh, ask you, please pray for me for uh, God's grace in my life, His, His mercy, and I need to improve my English quickly. Yeah. <laughs> and I would like to speak like, you, but <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, okay. Uh, what else? My family, my wonderful daughter, Liv, is so beautiful, look like me, <laughs> her life, and yeah, my wife, my wife, she, she is in Spain now, she could come in time but the most thing important for me personally i'd like to say thank you this great man pastor spencer he became more than a pastor for me really he became uh, like a father like a father more than uh, a close brother thank you so much Thank you, Publio. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Good. Well, as you can see in the program, uh, we came here as a family at the end of 2017. Uh, I was fresh from university in Aberystwyth where I studied criminology. So I like to go around telling people that I moved from the law to grace when I came here to seminary. <laughs> Uh, at the time, I was convinced that the Lord was calling me to uh, overseas mission. Uh, so much so that if you read my application form, uh, I mentioned that although I felt uh, a calling to uh, the, the pastoral work, uh, ultimately we wanted to be missionaries in the Philippines. Uh, over the two years since we've been here, we've seen many changes. We've seen the desperate need for pastors and preachers 
in the UK. So I would appreciate your prayers for us for, for clarity and that we would be willing to submit to the Lord's will, uh, whether it's here or on the other side of the globe. But the next step for us is to move to Maiden Bar Baptist Church in Crawley. Uh, I spent three weeks there at the end of February uh, with the pastor there, Jeremy Walker. Uh, so do pray for us as we move down there that we would be a valuable addition to the membership uh, and also a godly example to them, as I'm sure they will be to us. Uh, they say, don't they, that the more you know, the more you realise you don't know. And I found that to be the case since being at seminary. I'm so grateful for, for the lectures, for the teaching. Uh, I feel really that I've only just scratched the surface. Uh, so do pray for us as I continue uh, to build upon all the things that I've learned here at seminary and that I would be a valuable uh, preacher of the gospel. Uh, it has been a, a humbling process being here at seminary, so I thank the Lord for his continued help. Um, thank you to the brothers. Thank you, brothers, for your continued fellowship. Thank you for your encouragement, for the way that you've stirred my soul to love Christ more. Uh, I will miss you, uh, and I pray that you will continue to be blessed as you finish your studies, and uh, that we would continue to keep in touch and uh, encourage one another in the furtherance of Christ's kingdom. Uh, so I'm looking forward really to the, pro uh, the prospect of no exams. My brothers have loved to tease me uh, that I came to seminary uh, straight from university, before that sixth form, before that uh, primary school and secondary school. So I'm looking forward now to uh, no more exams, I think, more than anything. Unless, of course, the church has planned something that they've not told me about. <laughs> Uh, yesterday morning, morning we were reminded, reminded in morning, morning, morning worship that as you head out into the ministry, ministry you head out into, into the battlefield, battlefield you, go you go to war. war. And, and I pray that most, most of all I would, would be the kind of soldier who unwaveringly looks to Christ uh, as, as I minister his word. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Everyone. Okay. That's now, sorry. I obviously have decided, decided to uh, uh, have, have a, a proper uh, biblical uh, training that God opened open the door for me in 2015. Uh, I came to here. Yeah. Uh, it was challenging because uh, the last time I was in the lecture hall nearly many, many years ago, it's very difficult to uh, sit. Uh, but God graciously gave me the, the strength to follow everything. And, um, I will continue the Lord's work uh, that he has placed me uh, in my this evangelical church uh, here at Highgate, London, and apply what I have learned uh, during this last uh, four years. Uh, I also just the opportunity to thank everyone, like the uh, like, uh, person, uh, uh, principal and the former principals here, and also the vice principal and uh, and each lecture uh, who train me and uh, be patient with me and encourage me uh, when I'm going wrong with the essays and encourage uh, me. And those are things uh, I uh, want to thank. And also I want to thank the, uh, the uh, friends of uh, London Seminary uh, for their prayers and, and also their generosity uh, towards us. Uh, and also I thank for the administrator, uh, Hillary, and also I have registered um, Nigel. Uh, really, there's a first point of contact. Contact them, they always go extra mile uh, to help me out. I really thank uh, for their encouragement and their, and their prayer too. Uh, I, want, I, I, I want you to pray for me because I have to face so many challenges in your future as a church, uh, as a family, uh, and also we have so many things to handle. So please, for God's wisdom, that's the main thing I want, for God's wisdom. And also pray for me to humble myself to uh, do God's work. Learn something with some... Uh, we sometimes we tend to think that we know everything, but let me humble myself to continue my God's work. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Suri. It's very good to know and to look at Grace Evangelical Church in Highgate, and you can then see videos of Suri preaching in Tamil.
and you really feel that then he is he is uh, he is in his natural environment so if sometimes I think uh, when Surya approaches at the seminary, he's perhaps a little bit inhibited, and then you, you look at him on YouTube, and, and he's, uh, he's he much greater liberty and enjoyment of preaching in his own language, and then it's translated into English, as there are English-speaking speaking folks who are also coming to that congregation now. So uh, the Lord bless you in that ministry, Suri. And now, uh, Adrian. Afternoon. Um, so I start by just saying I'm I'm very grateful for my three years here. I've had a great three years. Um, for all I've learned, I learned among other things how much I did not know the Bible when I came here. I'm 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 thankful for the way in which I've been equipped for my current ministry, which I just started in my last year, um, and the future possibilities. Um, so I, in September um, of last year, started an assistant minister role in South East London, uh, which is a church plant aimed at, uh, with the vision statement, I should say, um, to launch and grow a church of such a diversity that can only be explained by the gospel. Uh, that's an amazing vision statement, but it's, it presents so many challenges. And so I, I would really love your prayers for that. I would welcome your uh, prayers for wisdom, um, for grace, and for humility in serving in Southeast London. Um, another thing that you know is very, um, very much in my heart is, you know, I would love to see, uh, as part of what we're doing in Southeast London, um, more men from my kind of background and heritage, uh, kind of West African, uh, coming to the gospel, one that's not, you know, a prosperity gospel or one that's unclear. So we'd love to see more people coming here, but also uh, for the Lord's help in reaching people like that and seeing them also coming into leadership. And so uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian. Um, and if you're wondering what's happened to Ollie Land, who is the sixth student on your insert, Ollie Land has been a, uh, a modular student with us uh, over the last few years. And we don't normally include modular students in the Thanksgiving service, but Ollie has taken some significant modules uh, over the last few years, and he's been part of our seminary community. So we thought at least we should mention him and we should show you his photo so that you can uh, pray for him um, as he continues his ministry, ministry at Rochester. Thank you, Spencer. Well, we commend the students now to the grace of God. Let's pray together. Great God of salvation, we come before you this afternoon. We give you praise and thanks to Jesus Christ that you have provided for us in the gospel this wonderful message of the Jesus Christ, the gospel which is still the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. He's in Jesus Christ, a savior who saves to the uttermost all who come to God through faith in him. We thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of these men that we've heard from now as they seek to go out and preach this gospel and make this savior known we pray, Lord, that you will fill them with your spirit and grant them to know that enabling and uh, enduring grace of God in their lives, that they may be faithful ministers of the new covenant. Jesus Christ known, we pray, Lord, that you will help them in every way, that they will come in dependence upon you as we do this afternoon, day by day, and looking to you as the God who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or even think by the power of God at work in us. We pray they may prove the promises of God to them. Yes, and amen in Jesus Christ. So, Lord, grant them your help, your strength, your enabling. May they indeed be good soldiers of Jesus Christ, enduring hardship for him, pressing on through every obstacle, not being uh, deflected away, but looking to Jesus Christ as the author and the finisher of their faith. We pray, Lord, that you will 
give them many years of gospel ministry. We're aware, Lord, that we are living at times in the UK which can be confusing, sometimes turbulent. We pray that you'll give them that foundation in their lives by your word and by your Holy Spirit, not to be deflected or discouraged or cast down, but to keep and press on in the work of the gospel. We're aware too, Lord, of the enemy, the Lord, Je uh, the Lord Jesus Christ promises to build his church and that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But we have an enemy. We pray, Lord, that you will keep them from evil, from the evil one. And Lord, in all their weakness, may they prove your great strength. Lord, when we are weak, then we know the strength of God. Oh, Lord, make bare your mighty arm in salvation to them and in their gospel work. We pray that many will be brought out of darkness into light. From the power of Satan to know the power of God. We thank you for the places where they've been called to minister. And we pray, Lord, they may be blessed there and be a blessing. So, Lord, we look to you this afternoon. We thank you. We praise you for the work of the seminary, the training that they've had, the, uh, uh, all those who've been involved in that work. But now, Lord, as they go out into gospel ministry, Lord, will you equip them yourself and go with them in every way. We pray for them, their families, in every part of life, Lord, surround them with your grace. And may they prove the faithfulness of a covenant-keeping God. Hear us, we ask. As we come to you now, we come in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just a couple of uh, notices, which you'll see at the back of the service given to you. That following the service this afternoon, there will be a buffet tea served out on the lawn. And uh, if you're able to stay for that, all are very welcome to stay and be and enjoy that tea together. If you want to uh, give a call to the work of the seminary, there'll be a, a receptacle somewhere at the back for a retiring offering that will go towards bursary funds to help students who want to come to study but who perhaps will have certain financial constraints upon them. And the money that's given will go towards the bursary funds that enable that to happen. After we sang, Adrian Reynolds, who's the Associate National Director of the Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches, will come and preach God's word to us. We're thankful to him for coming and serving God in that way among us this afternoon. So before he comes to preach, let's sing together another hymn. For God, beyond all praising, we worship you today. And again, as the music starts, we'll stand to sing. glasses go down. I'm a bit nervous. I'm going to knock another one. If you've got a Bible, if you'd like to turn to Matthew chapter 18, I think you'll find that a help. You don't have to do that, but I think you'll find that a help as we sit under God's word together. And as we have our Bibles open, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your son who spoke these words that we've been reading was filled with your spirit as he spoke them. Father, we thank you that your spirit inspired these words to be recorded. Thank you that your spirit has preserved them for us. And now we confess our great need of his help. Father, we don't simply want to understand what we read. We want to believe it. We want to do it. And for that, we cast ourselves upon you. We need your help. So grant us your spirit, we pray. For Jesus' glory. Amen. Amen. You may think this is a rather strange passage to choose for a, a happy occasion like this. Maybe you think the students missed out on their church discipline course and we're just kind of talking about it. But I want to show you how this is an entirely appropriate passage for us to look at today as we listen to God speaking to us through his word. But there are two truths, two truths which are evident here in the passage and which underpin all gospel work. The two truths are these. First of all, there is something that is precious. 
And the second is that it needs to be guarded because there is sin in the world. There is something that is precious and it needs to be guarded because there is sin in the world. I grew up in Southend on Sea, which if you don't know where that is, that's about as far east as you can go in Essex before you drop off into the water. Um, we lived there because my grandparents were all EastEnders, and like many EastEnders, they'd been migrated out in the 1930s. We didn't have many family heirlooms, therefore, in our house. Uh, some of you may have a family heirloom, a Van Gogh on the wall, or a Leonardo sketching that just got passed down from generation to generation. We had nothing like that, except for one object. And the object we had was a Victorian watch, a very early Victorian watch, a, a big watch on a chain, like the full watch that you would have put in your waistcoat pocket. It was quite an unusual watch. Uh, so unusual, in fact, that as I was growing up, it was not at home, but on display in the British Museum. I often wondered how it was that we came by this watch. Uh, my grandfather spent the duration of the Second World War in prison for black market trading, so perhaps it's not best to ask many questions at the provenance of this particular watch. Nevertheless, there it was in the British Museum, and we wanted to see it, we had to take it to London, and we would go and dutifully see it. And then uh, one day, when I, I guess I was about 11 or 12 years old, my parents had a letter from the British Museum. I can't remember the letter exactly, I'm paraphrasing somewhat. But the, letter, the gist of the letter was something like this. Dear Mr and Mrs Reynolds, Thank you for the loan of your watch at the British Museum, for which we're extremely grateful. Uh, we've bought some more boring rocks, and therefore there is no more room for your watch. Please come and collect it. Anyway, something like that, they sent a letter to my parents. And my parents had to travel up to London, and they had to pick the watch up. They did that, they brought it home, and they put it in a display cabinet that was in our front room. Pride of place, that was our one family heirloom. And two weeks later, just two weeks, we were down on the beach. I say beach. If you've ever been to South End, you'll know it's kind of it's a kind of beach, but there's no sand. Anyway, we, there we were on the beach, as we often were on a sunny day. The house was all locked up, apart from one little fan-like window at the back of the house. I guess the size of my Bible there, which was just open to let some air in. And sure enough, someone came around the back of the house, put a ladder up the back of the house, reached in through the window, unlocked, unlatched the bigger window, climbed into the house, and stole the watch. Our one precious possession had gone. Now, I don't tell you that story so that you might pity me, well, only a little bit, <laughs> a little bit of pity perhaps, but, but I tell you that story because it illustrates the two truths which are here in this passage. There is something precious and it has to be guarded for there is sin in the world. The precious thing is not simply a thing in Matthew 18. Uh, the, the precious thing is indeed the church. So precious. And it needs to be guarded because sin is in our world. And at some level, at least, those two truths underpin the reality of all gospel ministry. Whatever you are doing, and in fact for all of us who are living and working and serving in churches. We might not be paid or have a full-time job or a title like some of these brothers we've just heard about, but all of us are living and serving in the church. And so they are two truths that all of us need to grasp. The church, such an unusual word in fact that Jesus rarely uses it, but he, he uses it here. The church is precious, but it needs to be guarded for there is sin in the world. I want to show you, if I may, just how clear it is in the passage that the church is this precious object to both the Father, indeed, and to the Son. Just look down at the passage with me, or if you haven't got your Bibles open, you can just listen along and follow along. I want to show you that the myriad of ways that the preciousness of the church is demonstrated here in the words of Father. So the preciousness of the church is seen, first of all, in the vocabulary that Jesus uses. He begins, of course, as you know, the passage perhaps, as a child is brought to him, and that spurs him on to talk about the kingdom of heaven, and in fact to talk about his church. And he uses the language of the little one to describe not just children, but believers. 
If anyone, verse 6, causes one of these little ones, who are these little ones? Those who believe in me, he says. If anyone causes one of these little ones to stumble. Such an important little phrase. It's used in verse 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. It's used in verse 14. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any one of these little ones should perish. It's a compassionate language. It's a language of, of parenting, of caring, of kindness, of love, of forgiveness. I've just become a grandfather, which is a great excitement. And partly, I, I love babies, and so it's lovely to have a baby around again. We've got three daughters, two are grown up and have left home. We've got one daughter who's 15, going on 16, still at home. And, and she gets a bit embarrassed if I use this kind of language with her. So she doesn't want me to say, my little one. That's a, that's a bit too much, Dad. You know, steady on. But suddenly, there's little Hannah, who's arrived into the world, a tiny little thing, and I can hold her in my arms, and once again, I can use those kind of words, my little one, my precious one. This newborn baby, so vulnerable, so weak, so helpless, yet so lovely. So you see the preciousness of the church in the vocabulary Jesus uses, first of all. Second, you see the preciousness of the church in the brutal way, really, that Jesus describes what will happen to those who cause these little ones to stumble. I, I wonder if you noticed how shocking the language is. It's almost as though it sounds as though it would belong in a, in a Godfather movie, yeah, some sort of mafia drama, The Sopranos. It would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. This is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. How, how come? How so harsh? How come so brutal? Because the church is precious to him. You see it too in the strength of the language that follows. The, the little section that follows after you may recognise the words from the Sermon on the Mount. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. That all seems rather extreme, doesn't it? It's better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out. Doesn't that seem a little extreme? It's better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. No, not extreme. Because of the preciousness of the church. And, and the destruction that sin can do. There is sin in the world. And there is a real risk that this sin, this evil that is in the world, will invade the church and, and destroy, break up. This is precious, precious bride. You see it in verse 10. I'm, I'm grateful that I haven't got an hour and a half to preach to you this afternoon. You're probably grateful about that too. Um, but I'm grateful I haven't got an hour and a half to, to preach to you because I don't have to spend too much time trying to explain to you what verse 10 really means. Ten commentaries, you'll find ten answers. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. Well, that's okay. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Now, what is clear is this. There is an intimate connection between what goes on in heaven and the heavenly beings and what happens on earth. God is not disinterested in the church, uh, like he's kind of just set them off and off you go then. But the Lord God himself, together with all these heavenly creatures, are intimately connected to this precious thing on earth. That's how precious she is. You, you see the preciousness, sorry, I've lost count, it must be about number five, isn't it? You, you see this preciousness, verse 12, in the parable that Jesus gives. Now, this is not the parable of the lost sheep. Very similar language, which is perhaps unsurprising to us. Jesus lived in a, a pastoral setting. This is the parable of the wandering sheep. This isn't about going after the lost, that's a good principle, of course. This is about going after the wandering sheep, that the sheep who is part of the precious flock but has wandered off. And the father, for he is the subject of the parable, goes after the wandering sheep. The 99 are safe, but he doesn't say to himself, well, I'm happy just with 99. He says, no, they are so precious, this flock, that even when one wanders off, I will go after it, him or her. 
in the same way, verse 14, your Father in heaven is not willing that any one of these little ones should perish. Do you see the preciousness in the way that's worked out in the life of the church? Uh, verses 15 through to verse 20 are all about church discipline. And um, some young guys, especially, who have kind of reconnected with ecclesiology and the study of the church, get very excited about church discipline. And um, perhaps that's right at one level, but we need to see it in its context. Church discipline here is an enacting of the parable. How does the father go after the wandering sheep? The answer is he does it through verses 15 to Through the processes that are here, the stages that are here, which enable the wandering sheep to be won over. That's the language. You have won them over, verse 15. So there's a private process. If your brother or sister sins, well, actually, I think the footnote is better. I'll explain why that is in just a moment. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and point out their faults just between the two of you. If you listen, if they listen to you, you've won them over. So it's not, it's not on Twitter, it's not on Facebook, it's not in the church notices, nothing like that. It's a private moment between two individuals with the aim of bringing back the wandering sheep because the church is precious. Jesus is very realistic. There is sin in the world. And so not everyone will listen. So verse 16, there's an escalation. If they will not listen, take one or two others along. Uh, if there's you, by the way, and one or two others, just do the math quickly, there was two or three. And that fulfills, first of all, Deuteronomy 19. So there's the quote. So that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. They may still refuse to listen. So there's a further escalation at this stage it becomes public. Uh, by the way, those witnesses are, are not those who saw the original sin. You can't stand up at church and say, anybody else see what Bob did? Come along with me to see him. Now, these one or two who are coming with you are one or two who are making sure that you're doing things in a right and proper and godly and loving way because the church is precious. But even with these one or two others, they may still not listen. So there's an escalation. Verse 17, if they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And there's an escalation further. If they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I don't know about your church, but pagans and tax collectors are well, very welcome to come along to our church. Very welcome. We'd love them to be there. We love it when they are. They just can't be a part if they're not following Christ. Uh, for what it's worth, um, I think there are probably stages beyond this. Jesus doesn't talk about them. Uh, there's a hint of that in some of the things that Paul says, which is not for us to look at now, but there are stages beyond this, probably. But the point is this, the church is precious. Sin is in the world, and it's destructive, pervasive. But the church is precious, and so there is this process. Again, it's not a process that God is disinterested in. So I think that's where verses 18 to 20 come in. Truly, I tell you that whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. In other words, says the Father, when you go through this process properly and appropriately and in a loving way, you're doing what I love you to do. In fact, you're doing my will. You're going after the wandering sheep because the wandering sheep is part of my precious flock. Again, truly I'll tell you, verse 19, that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. Uh, there are many good verses in the Bible about prayer. I don't think this is one of them. I, I don't mean it's not a good verse. I mean, it's not primarily about prayer, is it? The obvious setting, who are these two or three who gather in the name of Jesus? They are the two or three who go along to see the wandering sheep. Jesus wants the wandering sheep back, so does the Father. And so when you gather in his name to try and win back the wandering sheep, you're not just there, you're there with him. He's there with you. Finally, you see this preciousness in the words that Jesus speaks to Peter. 
Peter, no doubt, has been sitting and listening to all of this. I, I, perhaps it's speculating a little, I don't know, but I like to think to myself that when Peter came to Jesus in verse 21 and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? I like to think that Peter was probably quite pleased with himself. Seven times. I, I think, by the way, this is why uh, verse 15 is, if your brother or sins, sister sins against you, because Peter then says, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Uh, Peter is basically saying, how many times, Jesus, must I go through this process to win back the wandering sheep? Seven? Now, if a sheep wanders off once a month and starts in January, that takes you through to July. That seems to me to demonstrate a remarkable amount of patience. And if every month he or she wanders off and Peter goes after him, and each time whoever it is says to Peter, oh, please forgive me, and Peter says, okay, of course I'll forgive you, come back, January, February, March, April, May, June, June July, and you're still going, I think Peter looks remarkably spiritual here. <laughs> Up to seven times. The church is so precious, so precious. That Jesus' response is clear. I tell you not seven times, but 70 seven. times. The church, you see, is precious. precious to the Father, precious to the Son. So precious to the Father that he gave his Son. So precious to the Son that he gave himself up. I don't know if that's a truth that you know today. I don't know if you're part of a church. I don't know if you would call yourself a Christian. But here is someone who is a Christian, someone who knows and understands that the church is so precious, God's people are so precious, that the Son has come at the behest of the Father and given himself for her. Given himself for her. Died for her. That is the preciousness of the church. And that is the necessity of this passage to demonstrate to us not just the preciousness of the church, but the reality of sin and its destructive nature. And therefore, this precious thing, this precious bride, this precious people must be guarded. Now, friends, what I want to do is to draw out five very important applications, and especially I'm speaking to you, I realize that, and in, in a sense, it's a bit like a wedding where you're speaking to a couple and everyone else is listening in. Today, I'm really wanting to speak to you friends over here on my right, but I want everyone else to listen in. Because if each of us lives with these two truths, that the church is precious to the Father, to the Son, and sin is in the world, and so the precious church needs to be guarded. So here they are. Five questions we need to ask ourselves as we embark on ministry, as many of us continue in ministry, as all of us serve in the local churches where the Lord has placed us. First question is this. Is the church precious to you? Is the church precious to you? We love church. We serve in church. We delight to do that because she is precious. Not because it's a job, not because it pays a salary for those of us who are lucky to earn a living that way. Not, not because just can't think of anything else to do on a Sunday morning or a Sunday evening, whatever it may be. Not just because that's what we've always done, but because she is precious. I, I want to tell you, friends, that one of the real temptations in ministry is to forget the truth. And to forget not that just that the church is precious, but that each individual member of her is precious. The, the truth is, is, there's no one here from the church that I attend, so I can say this quite openly. I find some people easier to get on with than others. Now, that may just be me. I'm guessing that's all of us. How are you to live and serve in a church if actually you don't get on with everybody in the same way? Uh, there are some people I just have more of a natural connection with. Perhaps we share some of the same interests. Perhaps we speak the same language. Perhaps we have a similar cultural background. Perhaps there are some people who I actually find 
really difficult. You see them coming and you kind of think, oh, no, not you again. But the thing to remember in all Christian service, and especially those called to be pastors and preachers, is this. Each one is precious to the Father. I, I love them because Christ loves them, not because they're lovely to me, but because they're precious to him. So precious, in fact, that he gave his son. One of the prayers I've had to learn to pray every morning on my knees is this, Lord, show me that your people are precious. Show me that your people are precious. Here's the first question. Is the church precious to you? Second question is this. Are you putting sin to death? Or to use a slightly older phrase, are you mortifying the flesh? See, if your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And that has a, a broader implication. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble, it will be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to us. If we are the ones who cause the little ones to stumble. But the mark of any Christian, any Christian, is someone who is putting sin to death. Facing up to battles, being honest about sin, confessing sin, seeing the Spirit work in their lives to change them from one degree of glory to another. And that must especially be true of those who are called to lead and to preach to God's people. We must be those who are putting sin to death. Not simply for our own sake, but because the church is precious to the Father. And sin is in the world, and it is destructive and pervasive and harmful, and ultimately deathly. So friends, I want to encourage, uh, encourage you about this right at the beginning of ministry to be thinking about putting sin to death all the time. To be thinking especially about those ministry sins which are so hidden and yet so damaging. The sin of pride. The sin of vanity. The sin of laziness. For others, the sin of overwork. Which looks very commendable to the world and to others. But in fact, it's still a sin. Are you putting sin to death? It's the mark of someone who has been called to preach or to lead God's people. Is the church precious to you? Are you putting sin to death? Third, are you going after the wandering sheep? Now, I've been a pastor. I know how this works. Someone's a bit difficult in church. They're awkward at the church meetings. Um, Monday morning, when the email pings, you know who the email is from. Several pages long, heart sinks. <laughs> I, I've been there. And the moment comes sometimes when the person says to you, I can't take it anymore, I'm going. And you breathe a sigh of relief. <sighs> Someone else's problem now. <laughs> so you feel as though a weight has been lifted. And go and concentrate on someone else and, and ministering to someone else and pastoring someone else in the church. I, I think we're very quick to let people go. We're very quick to let the sheep wander off. It's safer on the hill with a 99, isn't it? Not much cost in that. Not much danger in that. It feels an efficient use of our time. Whereas going after one, that hardly feels efficient, does it? Hardly feels like a good use of resources. And yet, if we understand that the church is precious, so precious to the Father that he should give his son, so precious to the Son that he should give himself, our ministries will be marked out as those who go after the wandering sheep. We want to win them over. Sometimes we only have to get past verse 15. <laughs> 
Sometimes we'll have to go a lot further. But we must be those who go after the wandering children. That needs to be part and parcel of our Christian ministry. That needs to characterize our Christian lives. We need to be those who are willing to go to others and point out their fault in a loving, godly way because we want to win them over. I, I think with shame, actually, of people that I've let go. As a pastor, I've not followed up on, I've not pursued because pragmatism kicked in. It simply seemed too easy at the time. I forgot that each one is precious. So those who are serving in churches need to be those for whom the church is precious. They need to be those who are putting sin to death. They need to be those who are going after the wandering sheep. They need fourthly to be those who are quick with forgiveness. Quick with forgiveness. How many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Seven? Jesus' answer basically is don't keep count. Don't keep a record of wrongs. And as those in church leadership especially, but actually all of us who serve in churches, we must be free with forgiveness when it is sought. Don't get me wrong. I think think sometimes we misunderstand what forgiveness is. I think sometimes we assume that forgiveness is unilateral. It's led, I think, sometimes by people who respond to some of these horrendous crimes that you see on the news. And they say, well, of course, I've forgiven them. And I I think there is a Christian response to some of these terrible crimes, which is to show grace and and mercy and love and patience and not to store up anger and to leave room for God's wrath. All those are Christian responses. But forgiveness at its heart is about reconciliation. It's about restoration of relationship. It's not unilateral. It's bilateral. And when someone asks to be forgiven and they are genuinely repentant, our response must be immediate. We must forgive others as Christ has forgiven us. And our forgiveness must be not simply free, but easily repeatable. Time. Even perhaps when we feel our patience is wearing thin. Even when we feel that people are falling into the same sins over and over again, if there is genuine repentance, we must be those who are quick to forgive. If you're pastoring a church, I wonder if this is how people in your church would describe you. You're a great preacher. That's good. It's a tick. Oh, he's a, he's a loving pastor. Good. He's a praying man. Good. He's an evangelist, committed to evangelism. He loves us. I wonder how many times you hear someone say, he's quick to forgive. Normally that's a criticism, isn't it? And yet it should be the mark of someone who understands that the church is precious. Is the church precious to you? Number one, are you putting sin to death? Are you going after the wandering sheep? Are you quick with forgiveness? And fifthly, are you yourself ready to be corrected? See, we've got to be honest about this passage. When I read verse 15, if your brother or sister sins against you, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. My immediate reaction is to think of all the people who have sinned against me. Who could they be? Who do I need to go and speak to? That's how this passage convicts me. But it has to convict us at another level, which is this. What if we have sinned against someone else? How, how willing are we to be the one who receives a private word? An incident happened to me earlier in the year where just this happened. Someone came and pointed out something I'd said. Um, I don't think it was intentional. I hope it wasn't intentional. But I'd said something which had offended someone and it was pointed out to me. And my initial reaction, I guess like many of us who, who too easily to come to pride, my initial reaction was to be defensive. To blame circumstances, or to blame, or to blame the person themselves for not hearing correctly what I was trying to say. Mark of a godly leader, godly preacher, someone who is serving in any capacity, which is all of us at some level in church, is someone who is willing to be not simply the giver of verse fifteen, but the recipient of it. Now, why do we do that? 
We do it because we know the church is precious to the Father. And we do it because we know that sin is in the world and it's pervasive and damaging deeply even. Friends, I don't need to be too discouraged by this passage. I hope you see that behind it all is a glorious truth. Yes, it calls us to live a certain way. Yes, it calls us to serve a certain way. But it does so because of the preciousness of the church. There will come a day where the guarding is no longer needed. There will come a day when there is no sin to break apart God's people, to destroy the work that's being done. Glorious day. But on this earth, as we serve the King, we need to know that the church is precious to the Father. We need to know the church is precious to the Son. We need to know this preciousness continues today. In fact, so precious that the Father, at the bequest of the Son, has poured out his Spirit on the church. And so putting chapter 18 into practice is not simply a case of putting our socks up. The question of allowing and welcoming the work of the Spirit in our lives to make us more like Christ. To do that work of sanctification, to change us from one degree of glory to another. That we might fulfill this wonderful, wonderful calling to love and to serve and to give ourselves to the work of seeing the precious church increase and flourish. Friends, I want to suggest to you this is a, a great high calling. Bless you for listening to the Lord's voice. Bless you for giving time in your lives, busy though they are, to come and learn and to be trained. And as you serve the Lord in ministry, may you always keep this preciousness before you, and may it fill you with joy and delight at the privilege of serving him. Let us pray together. Father, we want to rejoice above all things that we, in some extraordinary way, are precious to you. Thank you for the grace and love that you have lavished upon us, that we should be called your children. As we reflect on this great truth, as we rejoice in the giving of the Son for us, such generosity, as we rejoice in the pouring out of the Spirit upon us. Such power and love. We want to keep before us this same truth that motivated you. Oh, please may it fill our hearts. Thank you for every church that is represented here. Thank you for every servant here who is working and serving for you in the local church. May we do it keeping in mind these truths we pray to the honour and glory of our Saviour who died for the church, who gave himself up for her. So precious was she. Hear our prayers. Grant us the help we need in the Spirit's power. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. We're going to worship God further together as we sing now our closing hymn. It's on our leaflet for us. Closing hymn, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken, Zion, City of Our God. Staff, we'll stand to sing.
If you'd be seated, please. As well as the benediction, I'm going to give thanks for the tea that's been prepared for us. And if you're able to stay, you are very welcome to join with others in a further fellowship now as we give thanks to God for his word, for the meal that's been prepared, and for all that we've heard this afternoon. So let's pray together. Lord, we come to you this afternoon. You are the author of every good and perfect gift. We thank you for your word, which we've heard, the testimonies that have been given. We thank you too for the food that's been prepared, for Giovanni and others who've worked hard to prepare it for us. We thank you, Lord, for every provision for our needs. And as we give you thanks to our Lord Jesus Christ now, we come to you as the great God of heaven and ask that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will rest and remain with each one of us and all God's people everywhere this day forevermore. Amen. Amen.